are older people getting pop music all wrong? That may be the contention of our next guest. Jim Fusilli is author and rock uh, uh, author of several books, including a new book entitled Catching Up, which we'll get to in a minute. He is rock and pop music critic for the Wall Street Journal. He is founder and editor of RenewMusic.net or RayNewMusic.net, depending, I suppose, on how you choose to interpret that. And he is the author of a new book entitled Catching Up, Connecting with Great 21st Century Music. Now, uh, Jim, first of all, thanks for coming on the program. My pleasure, Roger. And next, um, I I heard that the inspiration for this book was basically that there is a group of a large group of older listeners who think that the best music, our best music days, are behind us, and they're wrong. Is that a fair summary? I would say that's a fair summary. Uh, we call them GBs or the generationally biased. And um, I need to be clear about this because GBs aren't people who like old music. I mean, I like old music. I think everybody likes the music of their youth. But a GB is somebody who likes old music, the music of their youth, rejects today's music, doesn't listen to it, and puts it down. Okay. And and so the point of your book was to say, no, actually, there's a lot of great music being uh, made, and and you're missing out. And this is kind of uh, what a kind of... uh, tour book uh, intro for, uh, you know, modern music for dummies or something? Well, no, not. uh, In fact, um, I have a high regard for uh, music fans uh, who are around my age. I'm 62. Uh Um, I think the recording industry has completely abandoned us. I don't think they address us at all. I don't think they care or even know how to sell new music to us. So it's not the fault of the consumer by any means. I mean, we are living in a period uh, that I consider a glory period for rock and pop. And yet most people my age, uh, most grown-ups, wouldn't know that because the industry has done very little to to educate us about that. Well, that's that's interesting. Uh, and by the way, we're, we're same age, same generation. And uh, I, I have to admit, you know, I used to be a musician myself. I was full time in the music world. I've written about it a little bit. I do not. I mean, I'm doing other things now. I do not follow it the way I used to. Um, I, I try to follow it. But uh, I, I have to say that, you know, I had a couple reactions. One was that your book seemed like a great idea. The other was, you know, in looking at it, and I did look at your book, I, I think there might be a false equivalence in saying that, you know, the Arctic Monkeys, is tal- and I, who I think are extremely talented, British group, uh, are equivalent to the Stones or the Beatles or, or that, uh, you know, Erica Badu, is, as interesting as she is, is equivalent to some of the great artists of the of the last century. So uh, on the one hand, I listen to myself and think, Jesus, I sound like my parents. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm not sure whether, uh, and I just want to explore this with you, whether a great thesis on your part leads to a kind of false equivalence between artists. Well, I think you've inadvertently exposed the flaw in the thinking of some people who inadvertently become GBs. Um, there were no bands like the Beatles in the era of the Beatles. So why compare the Arctic Monkeys to the Beatles? Uh-huh. In theory, the Arctic, uh, by, by your logic, the Arctic Monkeys could be the second greatest band of all time. <laughs> That's true. Okay. Secondly, uh, I'm not sure it, I agree with that they are, but it's a great point. Yeah. Second, secondly, um, were the Beatles as good as uh, Duke Ellington? Right. No, it, also a good question. Uh, so, so uh, again, w- we have to compare apples to apples. Uh-huh. And um, would it be blasphemous to say the Arctic Monkeys are a better live band than the Beatles? I wouldn't know because I've seen the Be- I saw the Beatles live at Shea Stadium. I have not seen the Arctic Monkeys live, but I would be willing to go with an open mind. Okay, so, so he, this is how you begin to chip away right. at an entrenched way of thinking. Um, it's, look, I've seen the Stones probably 20 times, uh-huh. um, and I've always had a great time with them, always had a great time. Are they better than Muddy Waters? No. I would say, I would say no. Right. I, I, would, I would declaratively say, although it's a matter of opinion, I would state that almost as a matter of fact, a point of fact. Okay, so, so, so do, does that disqualify the Stones from our respect? 
No, of course not. And I don't think anybody is suggesting that, uh, I'm certainly not, maybe others are, I'm certainly not suggesting that these artists aren't uh, worthy of respect at all. I mean, I think Adele, you mentioned Adele in your book. She's terrific. Gary Allen, terrific. Uh, uh, Arcade Fire, terrific. Blind. Now, I do have to say this. We're talking with Jim Fusilli, whose new book, very well worth a read, I'll add, is Catching Up, Connecting with Great 21st Century Music. I do think, I wonder... Yes, you, you do cover music that was released in the 21st century. Some of it is by people, dare I say, older than us. Um, some of it is by uh, older artists. And God bless Lou Reed for making a good, good record in 2000. Uh, the Blind Boys of Alabama in 2001 were probably already in their 15th incarnation. I think they started in the 1940s, if I recall correctly. Sharon Jones, late bloomer, but somewhat older, as I as I recall. So uh, you've got a great... Actually, Morphine was a great group. Um, uh, so, no, you've got a lot of great people in here. I guess maybe it has to do with... Uh, how would I put this? Um, the false uh, uh, polarity between that it has to be one or the other. It does, no, and, and I don't suggest that it does. In fact, uh, in, in Catching Up, you will see that I encourage people not only to listen to the music of the present, but to listen to the music of the distant past. Um, one problem that some boomers have is that they have a tendency to think that rock and pop began in the 60s. Right. right. And, we- and, and we hear extraordinary music from before that period. So this is the beginning of opening your mind to a new way to listen to, to popular music. If great music existed before the 60s and 70s, why wouldn't it exist after the 60s and 70s? No, it's a great it's a great point. It's a great way of looking at it. And just so you know my own story, Jim Fusilli, I, uh, you know, I, I've been a songwriter and a musician, but I started out, I remember being... Tw- 10 or 11 and looking at December's Children by the Stones and just reading the names of the people who wrote the songs, Chuck Berry and M. Morganfield, whoever that turned out to be, Muddy Waters and all the other names there and uh, finding Solomon Burke and, you know, uh, people going back uh, and, of course, Chuck Berry and so many other folks uh, through the Stones, uh, through the Beatles, through, but mostly through, more through the Stones and other bands, Paul Butterfield and, you know, others, going back to the source material, I would say your project is kind of, uh, is the same except moving forward in time instead of backwards. Fair statement? Yes, I think I, I, my, my ob- object here um, is is to do what the industry should be doing. Saying to people, listen, things are really different nowadays. Back when we were kids, uh, AM radio presented us with about a playlist of 15 songs made mostly by artists in the U.S. and the U.K., songs designed to be pop hits. Then FM radio came along, and maybe the list got a little bit bigger, but it was basically still... American and British bands, some experimental, some pop-oriented. Now it's everything from everywhere, from all time. There, there is nobody guiding people through the process of determining what has value and what doesn't. Um, if, if, you, if you're the kind of person who grew up with this mindset, if you grew up in the MP3 era, if you go to a lot of festivals where there was 150 bands playing, you're completely at ease in this environment. You're completely comfortable mm. in making up your own mind and not having anybody point you in this direction, that direction, or the other direction. If, if you grew up when we grew up, it's, it just seems overwhelming nowadays. I mean, yeah. what, how do we access and, and digest all of this stuff that's coming at us? And you, what, what, what I'm saying to people is um, it's worth it. The, it's worth it. Uh, 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 you know, that's a great point. We're talking with Jim Fusilli. Uh, 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 by the way, uh, uh, I've thought a lot about this issue of how we find a sort of filtration or a, you know, a way to get through new and old music to that which we love. At one point, I was very impressed with Beats Music because I went. it had you go through a series of questions. And then, in retrospect, I think strictly by accident, it came up with my what may be my favorite record of all time, which is fairly obscure, which is Dark End of the Street by James Carr, the rhythm and blues singer. 
And I was just stunned because I I couldn't have imagined in a million years that a computer could tell me that I love Dark End of the Street by James Carr. But in a sense, I feel whether it's old music like that or new music uh, like Anthony and the Johnsons or whomever, I feel like we need something. And I think technology is actually overrated for that. But I feel as if we need a... Uh, we used to have a mediation process through the record music industry, through the magazines when they came out, through being able to go. I remember going to uh, the bookstore in New York City as a kid and listening to new albums, listening to Between the Buttons, uh, you know, on the turntable there. So uh, I guess the question is, uh, in, and it's beyond the scope of your book, I suppose, although you talk about it, but how do we get the record industry or somebody to introduce us to music we could love if we knew about it? Okay, RJ, can, let me just go back a, a second and challenge your description. I think the system you described was injurious to us as okay. music fans. I don't think the recording industry did us any big favors by selecting music for us to listen to. Okay, it worked out sometimes. I mean, it worked out with Motown. It worked out with the Beatles. Um, but by and large, the recording industry, uh, who the music they introduced us to in the late 60s and early 70s, it's not good. It right. doesn't hold up. Very true, very true. Okay. I stand they, corrected they, on that. Yeah. Know, no, yeah. no, I mean, it, 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 but this is a commonly held opinion. Right. Okay, you know, it, Take a look at the Woodstock album, okay? This is bad music, <laughs> okay? By any standard, the Woodstock Festival would be the worst festival of 2016. Right. I, I think that's fair, yeah. Okay. And by the way, so, the better music at the Woodstock Festival, some of it got left off the album. You know, and, and, Butterfield, and, I guess, was uh, there, right? Uh, well, also, some of the music that's on the Woodstock album wasn't recorded at Woodstock. I did not know that, okay. And so... Um, but, but, you know, this, I mean, the, but on the other hand, there are performances on the Woodstock album that I love. And there are bands from the 70s that I love. I, I, I'm just saying that if the industry put in our minds that that was a great period, they did us a disservice. Particularly if our instinct is to be a little bit timid going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the point I make in catching up, and I, I try to make this repeatedly, is if you've reached the stage in life where, where I am, okay, and, and, and you are, you know, um, maybe the mortgage is paid for, you know, uh -huh. maybe, the, maybe the kids Speak are... Speak for uh, yourself, yeah. You know, maybe the kids, are, or let's say the mortgage is under control. Maybe the right. kids are off to college. Maybe the career is in a satisfactory place. We're no longer continually driving right. forward, obsessed with other issues. Now we have time to step back and enjoy music again. And no one is helping us get back into the process. Okay. This is not the fault of the consumer. You know, these consumers, our, uh, I call us grown-ups. I don't use age as a determining factor. Grown-ups know how to get things done. They know how to move forward. They know how to get what they want. But in this case, there seems to be so many obstacles that it's just easier to give up and take out the old Eagles album. Right. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Then, uh, uh, yes, absolutely. Um, and I think you're right, and I think that uh, it's a bad business decision on the part of the record companies. I will, e e e and you are right. I mean, as a filtration system uh, in the '60s, we've kind of, people, including me, have retroactively given it uh, credibility it didn't deserve. In fact, I remember trying to cheat it when I was a kid by listening to the satellite bounce of the London radio stations to try to pick up the bands they weren't bringing over here. Um, right. So yes, you're, you're you're quite right. It was it was more suppressive. But then, what's the answer? How do we get? I mean, there's there are significant sales. The other thing that you didn't mention about grown ups that should be of interest to record companies is that they're more likely to pay for music. I would exactly. think. So why aren't the record companies uh, serving this market? And and what could they be doing? Well, I have a theory um, about this. Um, I believe that the recording industry does not know how to sell music as music. They don't know how to sell music as art. They know how to sell it as lifestyle, as a part of culture, as fashion, as an indicator of hipness. Um, but they don't know how to sell it as high-quality art. And people our age, grown-ups, 
you know, I'm I'm not interested in what kind of beer some some musician drinks or, or who she's dating or what kind of clothes they wear or right. who they who they're voting for. I don't care about any of that. I just want to hear really good music. And I think the industry is incapable of doing that. And I think again it goes all the way back to the 70s where um you know, the cabal got, this is an imaginary scenario, but the cabal got together the morning after Woodstock and said, my goodness, we can sell these people anything. <laughs> they've, you know, they've laid in the mud for right. three days listening to bad music, and they think they've had a spiritual experience. All we have to do is associate music with culture, politics, hipness, acceptability, and we can sell them anything we tell them fits this formula. Okay, most people outgrow that. Okay, most people, right. now we understand that, wait a second, there, there's some chicanery was going on back then. But the industry now doesn't know how to look at a 60-year-old and say, this is really great music. Just try it. Tell right. me what you think. Does this have the qualities that you want in art and in music? The industry is not prepared. The machine isn't geared to do that. And we and, and and that I think is the best way to approach us. That's what renewmusic.net is all about. It just two or three times a day, it presents a new track from new artist. Once a week, it presents a 25 track playlist from albums that have been released on that Friday, and it it makes no judgment. It just says to people, I trust you. I know you're smart. Listen to this. I doubt you'll like all 25. Right. But if you like one. By the end of the year, you'll have 50 new artists you know something about. Right, and, and I think that, and, and and I think that's a good place to end up. You also don't have to like everything that you're introduced to. I love the idea of Renew Music done that. I, I I I'll start following it. You don't have to. I mean, I, definitely, a Spirit of the Century by the Blind Boys of Alabama. Is that the one that has run on for a long time on it? Yeah. Yeah, so, but it, it, it also has songs by Tom Waits and some other contemporary yeah. writers. I, I mean, look, you know, some some of the stuff you, you you write about, I know is fantastic because I have I haven't been living in a, a you know in a fallout shelter for 50 years. I actually do know, you know, that album, A Danger Mouse, and a bunch of the stuff you mentioned, but uh, Jay-Z and so on. But uh, I think a lot of people don't, and uh, I think they deserve to be introduced to it, and I think it's the job of the critic to be not the naysayer or the yaysayer, but, uh, you know, to introduce people to great work that they wouldn't know about otherwise. So thanks for doing this. Uh, thanks for writing Catching Up, and Jim Fusilli, and thanks for coming on the program. All right, RJ. We'll see you later. Thanks All a right. lot. Take it easy.